I'm going to talk a little about Australia. What I've tried to do, I've done this jointly with uh, a colleague of mine, Rapal Swamik, and what we have tried to do is to do some comparisons with the US, and Mike tells me all that shows is how ignorant I am about the US, and that I'm damaging my credibility by doing this, but nevertheless, it's there. The slides are set in stone. It was too late to change after I got his advice. So, uh, there are six topics, and I think I might get through five of them, so we'll sort of work at two minutes on each and see where we go. I'm going to begin by just comparing Australia with the US a little. Australia is actually quite like Texas in size, right? So we're a little cork in the ocean, and I think that motivates some of what we do in terms of policy. Uh, and you have there comparisons of GDP, comparisons of population. And the low government debt we have is, I think, a consequence of our awareness that we're a cork in the ocean and actually too much debt's a dangerous thing. Um, when you look at other aspects, though, of Australia and the US, it's not that different. We're not quite as rich as you in terms of per capita income or in terms of median income. We're a bit more equal than you, but these numbers are not numbers where you would say these are completely different types of economies, at least in these dimensions. And <clears throat> if you look at demography, it's quite similar as well. We live longer than you do, um, and our fertility is a little bit less than yours nowadays, but uh, we have a very um, aggressive immigration policy, and that kind of keeps us a bit young. So if you look at the support ratio, which dependency ratio, uh, we're almost exactly the same as one another, and we're projected kind of to stay the same over the next few decades. So in relevant aspects of, of uh, demography and, and demographic transition, we're not all, that, not all that different. This is the way I think about retirement income systems. I think of a kind of pillars approach rather than legs of a stool, and I have a safety net, and then I have compulsory income replacement as a kind of second pillar and then voluntary uh, voluntary material on top. And then the, the right-hand pieces of this chart give some alternative policy designations around those, those three pillars. And so if I think about the U.S., uh, if I think about <coughs> the U.S., it has SSI, which is quite small. It has a very large social security system, which seems to be the, the backbone of everything. And then it has voluntary, what I think of as voluntary, as in non-mandatory, uh, tax preferred 401ks and, and those other things that go with 401ks whose numbers I can never remember. But there, that, that seems to be the way I see, uh, US as a kind of schematic design. Um, in Australia, we rely very heavily on an age pension system which is flat rate and means tested. Uh, so it's the largest, the largest piece for us. And then that started actually in 1909. So a long time ago, just after we became a country. Uh, and then along with that, we have compulsory income replacement in the form of pre-funded saving. Uh, and we call pensions superannuation. Right? So this is a superannuation guarantee, and it's a little like Chile, with which many of you will be familiar. And you've got to put 9% going up to 12% of wages into a private uh, insurance company, superannuation fund, whatever. Uh, which is managed externally and which is subject in most cases to prudential regulation oversight. That allows people to, to add on, and a lot of employers add on beyond the 9%, as well as employees putting money in. So that's kind of tax preferred additional, and that's voluntary, and that's the piece at the bottom. So that, that's what we do. These fit together, because if you're going to give people relatively generous, non-contributory um, pensions, uh, to get them out of poverty, which is what we do in that top piece, then it would seem to be a rationale for not allowing people to free ride too much and insisting they do the saving if they can. And then as well as that, the compulsory income replacement, I think everywhere, goes to issues of myopia and self-control. And that's why, as Mike says, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of structures are so ubiquitous. So, this is what it looks like. 65 moving to 67 is the access age. And last night our treasurer announced that was going to go to 70. So 67 by 2023, 70 by 2035. Benefits are flat. Um, for a single person, they're 28% of average full-time male earnings and then 40% for couples. So we think a lot in terms of units rather than in terms of individual rights. 
The benefits, we have this odd interaction with the tax system for seniors, so seniors get taxed a bit less. I think this is common in many countries. And so the benefits are effectively tax-free because of that interaction. Um, so that gives you a, a bit of a higher net replacement rate than that 28%, even though it's if you take someone on full-time earnings, you get a bit more than 28%, you get 35% or something like that as a replacement. And we think of this means tested not as being kind of targeted at people who are destitute, but rather removing people who are affluent. Right? So uh, the phrase I use is affluence tested. So half the age eligible population gets a full pension. About a quarter gets part of a pension, so that's where the taper hits, and then a quarter gets nothing. This is very cheap for us. This at the moment costs 2.7% of GDP, and projections suggest it will be still less than 4% in 2050, partly because the superannuation guarantee will be building and will be removing people from the full pension and from part pension as those assets and the associated income streams accumulate. Um, <clears throat> the second piece is this mandatory retirement income system. It covers almost all employees, and as I said, the contribution rate is 99% moving to 12%. It's preserved and then tax-free at age 60. So you can take it out a few years before that, uh, 55, 56, 57, that's gradually moving up to 60, but you pay a tax penalty. At 60, it's tax-free. The thing that's different from the Netherlands, and while the Netherlands always beats us in the speed skating context, is that we have no decumulation structure. You can take a lump sum. There's no kind of mandatory structure around the drawdown, and that is a uh, I, I, that's the weakest part of, of, of what we have in, in broad structural terms. What are the outcomes? Well, I guess I should just say that, I'll just go back to this slide for a second. This didn't exist until the 1980s. Until then, we had no income-related mandatory policies at all. We tried to do Social Security a couple of times, and the legislation never went through. So this is kind of a late add-on, if you like, to that 1909 beginning. This happened in uh, 1992 was when the legislation finally went through. So it was a big gap where we didn't really have any income-related compulsory uh, income replacement in retirement. What are the outcomes? And here's where um, I guess I'm, I'm vulnerable. Uh, if we think of SSI, then the percentage of 65 plus is very small in the US, but in Australia it's quite large. Um, the value is higher in Australia than it is in the US. We do better on poverty as a result, so our poverty rates, this is taking the US, approximately the US type poverty rate of 40% of median income, and these are equivalized household incomes. Uh, it sits at 4, 5, 6, 7%. Um, yours is a little bit higher than that. So, looks like we sort of do okay in those respects. If we look at income replacement, and in the interests of time, I'm going to ignore that left-hand panel and just look at the right-hand two panels. Um, the coverage of private pensions, because so much, so the superannuation guarantee actually gives us very high coverage uh, because it's mandatory. And so we have 90% um, of the labor force covered, about 85% of the working age population covered. So most people have some coverage. Now, of course, they can move in and out, so contribution density is something else. But <coughs> Uh, coverage is there, and that and the figures on the left-hand side are our reading of what 401ks and that family of policies do for the U.S. If you look at the net replacement rate for low and average wage workers, our replacement rate's a lot higher, and that's where the first pillar cuts in, because although the first pillar only gives you 20%, 28% of average earnings, um, for someone on half average earnings, that's actually quite a lot, and then there's some superannuation guarantee as well. These numbers, by and large, come from the OECD, uh, Ed White House's pension at a glance and associated documents. What are the outcomes fiscally? This time we've added in disability in the Australian story to make them comp comparable to your old age social security and disability. And these are the projections. They're quite close at the moment and then they separate a little uh, as you move into the future. So fiscally, this is quite economical for us. Um, now what I want to talk about, how am I going for time? I just want to talk very briefly about some of the issues around means tests. Means tests are very unpopular <coughs> because very high effective marginal tax rates prevail during, over that period where there's uh, a, uh, 
uh, a withdrawal of, of, of the pension right. That, that with, withdrawal uh, only happens for, in Australia's case, about a quarter of the population, and there's a little bit, little bit of bunching around the edges where people try and stay in the pension scheme or try and just keep the full pension. But it's not a huge deal when you look at the numbers. Um, so although these are very high marginal tax rates, and this kind of a skyline story, this is a 40% taper that we used to have in Australia, it's now gone up to 50, um, <coughs> they, uh, uh, they certainly have disincentive effects for those people and for the people kind of around the edges. But for the rich, it's like there's nothing at all. And for the poor, it's like it's a demigrant. So the first point to make is that actually there are only a part of this population that's affected by these disincentives. And then the second point is that if you think about it economy-wide, the fact that it's cheaper means you can have low, lower labor tax rates. And uh, I think that helps a lot. As well as that, means tests, you can think of a means test as a personal capital tax, a personal capital tax which is age-based, which happens at the time. And there are analyses, Canesa is, is one that's uh, fairly well known, analyses that suggest that actually that's beneficial um, because of liquidity reasons and also because if you think of leisure, which is untaxable, retirement leisure, you think of a taxing its complement, which is retirement capital, makes some sense in terms of an optimal tax kind of argument. So there are reasons why you might suppose that this is actually advantageous. When you do kind of stochastic OLG calculations, which are always a little bit approximate, um, that comes out, that, that actually as you increase the means test from zero, as you go from a demigrant up, you, you do get uh, improvements in welfare. I just want to just make one point about compulsion and then I will stop. Out of time, he says. Uh, and that is, if you mandate it, you get more coverage. So up the top there, you have the Netherlands and Australia, and the Greens are mandatory. Auto-enrollment helps some. They're the teals. The reds are voluntary. So I didn't have time for public employee pensions. Here are the conclusions. Thank you very much.